Hi, I'm Keith the Candido. And I'm Andrea Lipinski, and welcome back to another episode of The Chronic Rift. And also welcome back to Andrea, who is back after her brief absence. Thank you, Tonight we're just... Um, we're discussing the works of one of science fiction's great authors. Last spring we talked about science fact and science fiction. Tonight we'll be talking about one of the people who's very big on science fact and science fiction, Dr. Isaac Asimov. That will be later on the roundtable discussion. We've got four people here to talk about him, too. But to begin with, we have a new entry for the Cole Meany watch. The character actor has been spotted by one of our viewers in the movie The Dead. Not only does this motion picture, based on a short story by James Joyce, feature Amini, but it is also the final film of the late director John Huston. You can find this film in your local video store. And here, with his comics, again, is Keith. Hello, everybody. This week's comic in review is Cheap Novelties, The Pleasures of Urban Decay by Ben Catcher, published by Penguin Books. It is a collection of the Julius Knippel real estate photographer strip that runs on page four of the New York Press. This is the best way to see the strip, really, because it takes some getting used to, and you need a few exposures to it before you figure out what's going on. Most strips either are continuing from installment to installment, or have some kind of gag, or both. Knibble doesn't follow either of those conventions. The narratives are self-contained, and the strip has none of the humor one associates with self-contained six-panel strips. Catcher is telling the story of people often seen as supporting characters in Woody Allen movies, or the main character in Will Eisner comics. Urban Jewish immigrants are children of immigrants who grew up either on the Lower East Side or in Brooklyn during the Depression. It's the world seen through their eyes. The people who buy cure-alls and go to doctors who provide the services they're too embarrassed to go to their own physicians for, people who spend too much time in diners or cafeterias, people who sell trophies or signs that they put in little one-room offices in their windows, most endearing of all are these simple, mundane observations about life made by Knipple. That only places, the only places that still have while you wait signs are shoe repair places and key duplication stores. The some salesmen won't put public phones to their ears. Architectural masterpieces that are only still up because nobody can afford to tear it down. All the different sights and sounds of the city, like a stickball bat on a rubber ball, beer kegs rolling down a street, a time clock, someone flipping through a magazine, someone else opening a can of corned beef hash, the police taking an apartment door off its hinges. In a field that has a tendency to exaggerate and overstate, this nice quotidian mundanity is very, very refreshing. Cheap Novelties is a raw one-shot, published by Penguin Books, 109 pages, $12.95 in paperback, and is available at your local bookstore. They'll probably do something silly like put it under humor, but that's where it'll be. Next week, I will have a preview of the Angoulême Comics Fair in France, a mention of a brand spanking new um, self-publisher, and a review of Epic Comics' Captain Confederacy. I'll see you then. Back to you, Andrea. Explain quotidian. Simple. Uncomplicated. You couldn't say simple or uncomplicated? I'd already said that before. I didn't want to repeat myself. Quotidian. <laughs> And finally, a rental Hawkins, or as we like to call him, Hawkman, with his couch potato salad. Hi there, I'm Rental Hawkins, and I'm back once again with another exciting edition of Couch Potato Salad. The new television season is in full swing, and it's time for me to teach all of you kids what to watch and what not to watch. But first, take a look at this. Come on, Brian, do it, bud. Do it, bud. That's not it. Try it again. Try it again. That's not it. Come on. Car went to New Orleans, Louisiana. Come on, Brian. Pour it on, bud. Pour it on, bud. Louisiana. So I should get some white. We're going home. Jimmy? Listen. I'm afraid Tasha can't come with us. Oh, fun spot, Bob. Well, partner, it'll be dark soon, so we have to build a shelter. Now, you go chop down 15 very tall palm trees. Go. Ah. I know I promised you a rest, and it's been a hard morning, but this is important. You know we never walk away from duty. Yeah, right, he's right. Stand back, Stanley. Roger. 
And now, without further ado, or a don't, the Couch Potato Salad Cartoon Cult's TV picks and pans. Don't watch. Tarzan. Tarzan. Bad. Enough said. Watch. Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego, a PBS game show for kids designed to teach them geography. It's based upon the computer game by Broderblend Software, and the object of the PBS version is to track down a member of Carmen Sandiego's gang across the world. The clues are provided in weird and interesting ways, and the grand prize is a trip to anywhere in the lower 48 states. If you want to learn a little bit about where things are, take a peek. Don't watch NBC's Wish Kid. It stars the voice of Macaulay Culkin, that kid from Home Alone. Macaulay Culkin has a cartoon? Ah! It's about a kid with a magical baseball glove, which allows him to make wishes. Yeah, real entertaining. Watch Darkwing Duck, anywhere you can find it. It's on the syndicated Disney Afternoon, on the Disney Channel, and Saturday mornings on ABC. He's the terror that flaps in the night, the zit on the face of injustice. He is Darkwing Duck, an adventurer who fights crime in the town of St. Canard and, the, and across the world for the super-secret organization, Shush. It's fresh and funny, and one of the villains is a vampire potato, which sucks the starch out of people, turning them into couch potatoes. I love that. Don't watch. ABC's New Land of the Lost. I was a fan of the old series, and this one just doesn't measure up. Watch The Pirates of Darkwater. This Hanna-Barbera offering offers us action, swashbuckling adventures, interesting stories, and great animation as we follow the young Prince Wren and his crew across the world of Myrrh in an effort to save this world from the evil of Darkwater. It's the best Hanna-Barbera offering in years. Don't miss it. Don't watch Yo Yogi. It's another Hanna-Barbera offering, but it's an updated version of Yogi Bear, taking place in the Jellystone Mall with Ranger Smith, turned into security guard Smith. No good. Watch, watch Erie, Indiana, the live-action series, the brainchild of director Joe Dante, revolving around the adventures of a boy named Marshall, best described as a weirdness maggot, magnet. It seems that Bigfoot goes through his trash, Elvis lives on his paper route, why? Because he lives in Erie, Indiana, the center of weirdness for the entire world. If you want to find out about what really happens if you live in a small town, watch Erie, Indiana. And finally, don't watch Hammer Man. The cartoon is about a hero who raps. Based on MC Hammer, the show is crap. The animation stinks, the story's for the birds. To make it really simple, it sucks moose turds. That's Hammer Man, folks. Don't watch it. And that's all for this installment of Couch Potato Salad. This is Arintha Hawkins saying, tune in, turn on. Veg out. Bye. Isaac Asimov published his first story in Amazing in 1939 at the age of 19. A pupil of astounding editor John W. Campbell, one of the great editors of the field, Asimov has gone on to be one of science fiction's most prolific writers, as well as a writer of science fact, mysteries, and according to friend Ben Bova, dirty limericks. Asimov is best known for his three laws of robotics, which have become accepted not only by other science fiction writers, but by researchers into artificial intelligence as well. The rules are, number one, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. The second, a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And the third is, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. You got all those down? Okay. We're going to have a quiz after this. In 1977, he got a magazine named after him, Isaac Asimov's Science Fiction Magazine, which remains one of the most respected science, fi science fiction magazines around. In 1987, the Science Fiction Writers of America gave Asimov a Grand Master Award for his work as a writer and editor. His output remains very high. 335 books written or edited by Asimov are presently in print, 86 of them within the past two years. He also has an editorial in the magazine that bears his name and a science fiction column in the magazine Fantasy and Science Fiction. With me and Keith to discuss this science fiction icon are, on my far right, Charles R. Dye, a writer and marketing manager at Davis Publication, publisher of uh, Isaac Asimov's science fiction magazine. Next, Cynthia Manson, the director of marketing at Davis Publication. On the other side of Keith, we have David G. Hartwell, consulting editor at Tor Books, uh, who um, reviews editor for the New York Review of Science Fiction and the editor of the World Treasury of Science Fiction. 
and remotely by phone from the Midwest, Martin H. Greenberg, prolific science fiction editor who has worked often with Asimov on, among others, the great science fiction series. Uh, Martin, it's very good to have you with us. It's nice to be here, but I, I must tell you I'm still having trouble hearing you. Okay, well, we'll, we'll speak up. <laughs> anyway. Okay, this is just for anybody. Uh, in the 1980s, Asimov went back to writing uh, foundation books and robot books, which he had stopped doing for a long time. Why do you think he went back to this? Well, I think it's obvious for fame and money. <laughs> uh, well, he already had both of those. I mean, well, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> however, uh, Isaac has been in the science fiction field since he was a teenager. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the science fiction field has been a, a good part of his life. And although he has, of course, gained enormous recognition for his writing in, in other areas, uh, it seems to have remained his first love all the way along. And, of course, uh, he's part of the competition. Uh, and, you know, with Arthur C. Clarke and Robert A. Heinlein and Ray Bradbury writing novels, why, Isaac's not going to stop writing novels. <laughs> well, it's uh, not so much stop writing novels, but why, why did he recently go back to those particular settings? Well, made? it seems to me that, first of all, uh, they were his most popular settings mm -hmm. in the past. Uh, second, uh, it seems over the course of those books that uh, he's been trying to uh, make them more coherent, more rational, uh, more logical, uh, and build a kind of absolute, almost godlike universal future construct, uh, which is really very impressive. Uh, and has certainly proven popular and has made Isaac and his publishers enormous amounts of money. <laughs> it's kept him right up there at the top of the field. Well, you can't overlook also the fact that Doubleday asked, and Isaac always says that Doubleday begged him for years and years after the last Foundation book came out um, to write Foundation's Edge, which was the first of the new series. Mm -hmm. And he put them off saying that he didn't know how to write a Foundation novel anymore, that he'd lost touch with it. And I think in part he had something to prove to himself, and he proved it exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. In fact, he just published the first new Foundation novella in 41 years in Asimov's science fiction magazine, and it's part one of a new novel called Forward the Foundation, which should be out soon. Mm -hmm. So he's not exactly... Uh, Losing any, uh, <laughs> not yet. Any no, yeah. I was talking to a teacher of mine who's a who's a science fiction fan today, and we we were talking about the Foundation novels, and he said that um, that the question used to be, when will Asimov start writing Foundation novels again? And now the question is, when will he stop? <laughs> because they keep coming out and coming out right. and coming out. He um he also went back to writing Light Bailey books and Daniel Oliver. One of the interesting things about them is that they're just as compelling as mysteries, as they are at science fiction. You wonder if he's like going to um, become a mystery writer or even... Wait a minute, he already is a mystery writer. writer. <laughs> well, yeah. He's been a mystery writer. Well, Isaac has published a number of short stories in both Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine and yeah. Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine, yeah. which are the two other digests that we publish at Davis Publications. Uh, so there's been some cross-fertilization uh, here at Davis Publications. So you're cornering the market, is right. what you're saying. <laughs> Marty, um, you had mentioned that... Um, He's influenced a lot of people and brought them into the field. Um, how, 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 how has that influence um, manifested itself? Well, I think perhaps uh, in, the, in, the, in the long run, the, uh, the greatest effect has been on, on people, uh, getting young people interested in science. Mm -hmm. And he's done that both with his science fiction uh, and with his, uh, his science writing. Uh, I understand that at the uh, Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at, uh, at MIT, the three laws of robotics are, are above the door as you go in. <laughs> uh, and I think that, uh, that says a lot about the, uh, the impact that, that he's had. Uh, I think he's been a, a, a tremendous inspiration to, uh, uh, to really people all over the world. Uh, and it's, it's been very important to him to, uh, to get people interested in all areas of science. He, he recognized, I think, from early in his career that science fiction was, was one of the most effective ways to do that. Um, yeah, that, that's something actually that I know that you mentioned it, and, and we also mentioned it in the introduction, is the three laws of robotics. For some reason, they always struck me as really arbitrary. I mean, what is it about those three laws that, that I mean, they're, they're very widely applied, but why are they such a universal? What, what is it about them that... that, that well, works? at this point, they're, they're simply traditional and conventional. I mean, uh, certainly, I, there's a wonderful anecdote that I've heard Isaac tell about uh, 
uh, going to see 2001 for the first time at a special screening. And uh, when uh, Hal, the artificial intelligence, uh, goes awry, Isaac stood up in the audience and said, wait a minute, that <laughs> violates the three laws. <laughs> But, uh, of course, I mean, they're not universal. They're, they're, they're a useful construct and a useful uh, way to think about how we would program an artificial intelligent machine or robot if we were able to do it that way. It would be useful to do it that way. Uh, it has been perceived so often as being useful to do it that way that these things become traditional. It's, it's, quite, it's reasonable, it's logical, it's good science. <laughs> there's, there's another element as well, just on a literary level, which is that the three laws are a perfect narrative engine. Once you've set up rules for your characters to follow, which they must follow, you then work through the permutations and see how you can break them. Right. And that supplied an awful lot of stories in the early days of Astounding. <laughs> One story. And also the, the Light Bailey yeah. books, once again. That, that exactly. Yeah. How, can, how can a robot I mean, kill? They, how had a, robot they had a lot of influence on other writers, too. I mean, Jack Williamson's The yes. Humanoids, for instance, is mm. certainly influenced by that. Uh, you know, what happens when the three laws work? Well, they work so well that uh, robots protect humanity from everything. Uh, <laughs> and even um, Isaac picked that up in a recent short story, Robot Visions, where a robot decides to allow humanity to, to be decimated and the world to be ruled by robots because they have a peaceful civilization in the far future. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. recently that has surfaced a lot in, in Isaac's writing. This, the, the idea of the zeroth law that robots yeah. can act against humanity if it's necessary and so forth. Um, he's bending, bending the limits of the, of the fiction he created. Well, once you've set limits, it's fun to try to bend them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, that's it makes, Just it look makes at the Ten Commandments. It makes you even more clever. <laughs> well, there are these laws that seem, you know, written in stone, and you have, you know, the, the, three, the three laws, and, you know, robots must follow them, but I was reading um, Poor, Poor Little Robot. And yeah. in that, it's like, oh, well, yes, we just altered the first law. Altered the first law. I mean, it's like the Ten Commandments. I mean, you can't alter the first law. Oh, well, we said that, that they just couldn't actively harm human beings, but we left out the part about, you know. You see, they're not written on stone tablets. They're written in astounding. Right. <laughs> Bridget, an old pulp paper that goes yellow after a few years anyway, so who cares? Um, to go to his nonfiction for a minute, he has this science column in FNSF and, and mm. has... Do you think he has, in a sense, legitimized science in a way by his pervasive influence either in, in the science fiction field or made it? I think it was, would be presumptuous to say that Isaac Asimov legitimized science. <laughs> no, but I mean... Uh, the, the, Galileo and then no, Isaac. Not, right. <laughs> uh, but I mean, no, in a sense, for, for John people... John W. Campbell might have done it for the science fiction field. Yes. And certainly, Isaac is a, is a hard science fiction writer, shows nothing but the highest respect for the scientific method and for scientific rationalism. Uh, has devoted his career to, uh, uh, in a very graceful way, educating people uh, in the ideas of science and making them seem attractive, charming, and wonderful. Uh, and I think that that, that it's the uh, his ability to charm mm -hmm. with the ideas of science that's really the source of one of his, his most profound effects. Uh, I think makes it fun. I also think that because he is such a humanist, and um, if you ever had seen the Bill Moyers World of Ideas where he had two interviews on that show, I think that what comes across, and I'm not a hard science person, I don't read science, but in fact just recently worked with him on a video that we're going to hope to release next year, which has to do with the frontiers of science right now, what's happening across the country that has... Uh, you know, experiments in labs, et cetera, that are going to have an impact on future technology. And I, who was very frightened of that <laughs> new technology, uh, spent, you know, a three hour taping with him, listening to him talk about these new scientific discoveries, and felt that it was accessible to me, that it wasn't like beyond my understanding. And I think it's his humanistic and approach to everything that makes it feel as though it's more accessible to, to people such as myself. Mm -hmm. Well, I think he himself, um, in the introduction to a book of his short stories I was reading, he himself was talking about all these stories that he had written about robots and saying, well, you know, as of right now, I've never actually seen one. You know, and it was sort of his writing about them was developing his own interest in it, and now his, his interest has gotten more into the technical science, like you were talking about the, the column in fantasy and science fiction. Yeah, well, in, in fact, uh, back in the 1940s and the 1950s, 
we all thought that in the future there would be these mechanical beings, you know, mm. with metal legs and, and gleaming metallic bodies and wonderful, handsome, sort of egg-shaped heads with <laughs> strange eyes that would be robots. Mm. They would look like human beings, mm. they would act like human beings, except that they would be machine intelligences mm -hmm. and there would be certain interesting differences. Well, in fact, as, as the history of technology and science has developed in this century, it is much less likely uh, that we are going to have these two-legged, two-armed, uh, superbly polished beings. Uh, we have a variety of things that, that are, in fact, robots that do, do not look in any way like human beings. Yeah, that's not we are not creating in our own image. <laughs> that's not necessarily practical. Not necessarily practical. Uh, and it's I mean, not necessarily <laughs> practical. Uh, in fact, there are a wonderful uh, array of science fictional robotic devices now mm -hmm. that are nothing like the classic uh, two-legged nursemaid. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I am here to serve you. Um, <laughs> Marty, Marty, you um, you worked with him as an editor. We've sort of been talking about him as a writer and as a scientist. What is his editing style? How is it? Um, is it? How is it working with him as an editor? Well, it's, it's delightful working with him. What what uh, what, what we do on, on our books is uh, I I do the initial searching. Uh, occasionally, he suggests stories uh, from memory. I send him material to look at. Uh, he is quite selective. Uh, our tastes are very similar, uh, but I can't remember a book uh, where he didn't toss out stories uh, and, and, and make suggestions. Uh, and uh, his, fortunately, we've been able to work together well uh, because uh, we both come to science fiction from uh, a similar uh, uh, literary and, and, and critical viewpoint. We also, uh, he also, of course, always uh, writes uh, an introduction. He used to deliver the manuscript, which is one of, his, one of the jobs I assigned him. Uh, but, however, in the last couple of years, uh, he's allowed me to mail them in. <laughs> Generous. Um, the Great Science Fiction series is done on a, as a yearly basis, the Great Science Fiction stories of 1962-63. You said he remembers things from memory? Oh, yes. Uh, one of Isaac's, uh, one of the keys to Isaac's success in, in uh, all areas of his productive life uh, has been a really amazing ability to, uh, to, to recall. Uh, he recall. He can tell you not only uh, the story, uh, the title, uh, the magazine it was in, uh, sometimes the issue, but also what he was doing when he read it. Uh, and uh, while I've noticed just a teeny weeny bit of slippage in the last few years, uh, he's, he's still quite amazing. Now his, his reading of science fiction uh, declined as his, uh, as his activity as a writer increased. And uh, once we got into the late 1950s in our series, uh, I was showing him things he had, he had, he was seeing for the first time. But before that, if they were in the major magazines in, in, uh, of those days, of the, of the then big three of Astounding, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction and Galaxy, uh, he, he, re he, he recalled all the stories that, that I said. Hmm. Hmm. What's, um, what's the criteria that you use for those stories? That, that they be important stories that have held up well over the years, uh, that they, that they uh, perhaps in a few cases have not received the attention that, uh, that they should have. Um, we, we try to bring several stories in in each book uh, that have either n never been reprinted or haven't been reprinted in, in a very great many years. And what's happening now is we have a, a devoted group of readers in this series. Uh, uh, who bring suggestions to us, uh, and including a number of, uh, of, of writers who, who uh, were reading heavily in those days. And, and it's, uh, I wouldn't describe it as a group effort, but uh, uh, I'm, we must average uh, several dozen letters a year uh, with suggestions about, you know, don't, don't forget this one or don't overlook that one. Right. One of the things that happens is uh, when, uh, when we go back and, and read them, of course, I was reading the stories in the 50s as a teenager. And stories that knocked me on my can in the 1950s, um, when I go back and look at them again, uh, it's, it's sometimes sad that, that they don't hold up. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, some years are better than other years. Mm -hmm. 
um, since you two are in a unique position to um, know what, what's coming up, what kind of things is he going to be doing in the, the year that's about to start? Well, the, the biggest news, of course, is that the second part of the new Foundation novel will be appearing in the 15th anniversary issue of Isaac Asimov's science fiction magazine. Oh. With Isaac on the cover in a gorgeous spacesuit with a beautiful right doors there. behind yes. it. That, that was the first installment. <laughs> right. And that's, of course, coming up. Uh, there will be continued coverage in the editorials of the magazine and so forth. And we hope we have one more of his wonderful George and the Zazzle comic stories coming up, and we hope to have more. Um, in my opinion, it's, it's the best one yet. And, and I, hope, I hope he sits down and writes a whole bunch more. Anything else? What is that video? Well, we're hoping that it's going to be released next year, and we've been working with a production company. Uh, one thing the editors of the magazine wanted us to mention was just the fact that he is such a pleasure to work with, that, that obviously this magazine may not have held up and survived the way it has during the last, you know, since 1976 without that Isaac Asimov name. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all, all four of you, for coming <laughs> on. Um, Marty, thanks a lot for sitting there with the phone to your ear. And um, next week we'll be talking about Spider-Man. Spider-Man, Spider-Man. Does it ever a spider can? Yeah. Versus Isaac Asimov. <laughs> 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 uh, not a bad idea, though. Um, and, um, we will see you then. Please feel free to write in with your comments. We'd love to hear from you, and we will see you next week. Right? Right. right. Good night. This episode was sponsored in part by Comics Interview, the magazine where both the fans and the pros turn to see who's who and how it's done. Read Comics Interview number 100 and see who the 100 most powerful people in the comics industry are. For a free catalog, write to Comics Interview, 234 Fifth Avenue, Suite 301, New York, New York, 10001. The Omega Zone, a store specializing in comic books and video movie rentals, including science fiction, horror, animation, and cult films you won't find at your local video store. Now at a new location, 258 West 15th Street, between 7th and 8th Avenues in Manhattan. Telephone, 212-645-6941. Daw Books Incorporated, publishers of high-quality fantasy, science fiction, and horror since 1971. For a free catalog, write to Daw Books Incorporated, 375 Hudson Street, Department T, New York, New York, 10014. Applause Books, publishers of the newly released Terminator 2 Judgment Day movie book, written by T2 director James Cameron and William Wisher. It contains over 700 photos from the film. You can learn more about the movie and see scenes that were cut from the film. You can find T2 Judgment Day at area bookstores or call Applause Books at 212-496-7511.